I um, start here with my presentation overview. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to jump around a wee bit in the talk. So um, I'll just give you a bit of a pathway to where we're going to head today on this presentation journey. Um, so just to start with, um, I want to talk, I want to connect this talk a little bit with what Christopher Howard was talking about last time in terms of mobilities and this question of ethics and what's happening with an increasingly globalised world and the role that writers and filmmakers can play in reflecting on some of these processes. Um, I'm then going to turn to um, Goethe, the um, famous German writer, and um, a sculpture called the Stone of Good Fortune that was outside of his garden house in Weimar as sort of an entry point to some of the ideas from my book. Um, I'll then move into look at some of the broad ideas from the book, including the research um, framework and some of the key findings. And going from that broader um, overview of the book, I'm going to then concentrate down into just one part of it, which is the um, Southern side to the saddle period, as Martha was mentioning, which is writings from this period of 1770 to 1830. So first I'll just drop in and explain a little bit about that particular concept of time and why the German historian um, Kosselik chose that as a particular construct to work within. And then I'll give some examples from the writing of the writers um, Forster, Nikolai and Camiso. And just finally, um, I just wanted to mention a few um, things that are going on in this area. So if you're interested in the intersection of mobilities and literature or what's going on um, in this space of southern mobilities, um, then I've got a few things that you might like to take note of at that point. Um, and then of course, if you have any questions, um, we can have a bit of a conversation which I think we really enjoyed doing last week. Well, I certainly did in any case. Okay. So last week, um, Christopher Howard, in my opinion, sparked a really great conversation about the ethics of mobility and how we must be conscious of how technologically enabled and multi-directional increased mobility is impacting on our lives, relationships, communications and experiences. As Christopher, and Vendelin Kippers, who co-wrote um, an article with him, pointed out last week, we need to theorise and develop a vocabulary to describe what is happening here in terms of positive and negative, or what is lost, but what is also enabled by these changing circumstances. Part of my research is to argue that the travel writers and filmmakers can make a significant contribution toward critical reflection in this space. Their insight can go beyond what's sometimes descriptive or non-critical observations to look at what an increasingly mobilised world means for us, how different people respond, and how we might think critically about what's happening. So not only describing what's happening, but also thinking about the impact on, on the human impact and what's happening in terms of sense of identity and changing culture and relationships and that kind of thing. So I just want to go into a bit more, I'll go into a bit more detail about this later, but I just want to preface this talk by giving an example from the Greek filmmaker Theo Angelopoulos. So, um, so and Angelopoulos um, directed the film Ulysses Gaze, which is one of the films that I look at in my thesis or in my book. Um, so Angelopoulos thinks of the idea of home in dynamic terms is an effective quality or a concept rather than something concrete and tied to a particular place. So I've got a quotation here. Home is not necessarily a real spot that is here or there. And I think this kind of relates a little bit to um, what Christopher Howard was talking about last week in terms of interplacedness, maybe from a slightly different angle, but talking about the meaning making that takes place relationally between locations and people are on the move. Angelopoulos also gives the example of Greece as a concept. Um, he says, I do not believe that Greece is only a geographical location. It extends much further than actual borders, for it is the Greece for which we search, like home. This Greece that is in my mind is the Greek Greece I call home, not this office or this place here in Athens where I'm sitting. So again, that's a quotation where he's really mobilising this concept of home as a dynamic kind of a thing rather than a really, um, you know, location-tied kind of a concept. Um, 
It follows that homecoming is more about it being at peace with oneself and others than arriving at a specific location. This leads to the assumption that home may be found while one is on the move. For example, Angelopoulos also says, for me, home is not your house, but a place where you feel in harmony, which in my case is in a car passing through a landscape. So I know that we all have heard about a lot of the, the work on automobility, for example, that this kind of a concept might connect to. If the feeling of home can indeed be found in a moving car, then perhaps there is hope for the future of mobilities. Okay. <laughs> um, I've got this um, picture here. Is, um, part, it's a focused in thing from the front of the book. Um, and I asked my friend Natasha Marakva to actually um, draw up this picture for me for the book because it actually relates to the introduction and kind of a metaphor for how I go about doing the research. So I'll just talk a little bit about that now. So um, Goethe moved into his garden house in Weimar in the east of Germany in 1776 and lived and worked there for six years. After this point, he moved into another house in Weimar, but he used the house as a place of retreat until he died in 1832. In the quiet corner of this garden house, or garden house, there is a sandstone sculpture that bears the name of the Stein des Guten Glücks, or the Stone of Good Fortune. It was put in Goethe's garden on the 5th of April, 1777, and Goethe had designed it in collaboration with a sculptor called Urza. Goethe wrote an entry in his diary marking the day in which the sculpture was put up and linking it to the Greek goddess of fortune, Taichi. In my explanation of the ideas behind the sculpture, I draw on the work of art historian Susanna Müller-Vott. The sculpture is the point of departure of my book, and you might use it to, um, as a powerful metaphor for um, conceiving of some of the mobilities research. So aesthetically speaking, the sculpture is quite simple in form. In essence, it's merely a globe resting atop a cube. Yet, if one inquires into the cultural meanings behind the creation of the stone monument from a mobility perspective, specifically the contrary forces which direct life, one is inevitably led down a path toward asking some of the most fundamental questions of human existence. Mobility's approach raises questions of physical and emotional movement, identity formation and relationships, and the continual search for an ideal balance in life. One might relate these ideas to the concepts set out in John Ory's and Mimi Scheller's 2006 New Mobilities Paradigm. The stone sculpture relates to the constant negotiation between two seemingly opposed ways of being, dwelling or remaining in one place on the one hand, and mobility or travelling to other destinations on the other. Connotations of dwelling, one could argue, are invoked, invoked by the cube that forms the base of the sculpture, which symbolises firmness, strength and peacefulness. This relates to ideas of groundedness, permanence and strength, the earth that supports us, yet to which we, especially the travellers among us, do not wish to be bound. The sphere which rests atop the cube may be said to be representative of the concept of mobility itself. That is, as a symbol of mutability, the dynamic and unanticipated movement. The sphere or globe relates to ideas of change, fluctuation, fate and uncertainty. Movement or journeying can entail wondrous possibilities but equally unforeseen danger or suffering. If the sculpture is then considered as a single form, it may be regarded as symbolic of humankind's ever-changing and contradictory experience of travel, from something to be avoided or endured, to an educational experience, to a fundamental human right, and of the desire to represent these experiences in a variety of expressive modes. Much of Goethe's work revolves around the, an exploration of antinomies. As well as conveying these ideas through the medium of the garden sculpture, he wrote poems which engaged with the contradictory ideas of permanence and stability, as well as transience and change. I'll now give a bit of an overview um, of the research framework from the book. Um, so in my image here on the PowerPoint, we kind of move from this idea of this sculpture in Goethe's garden from the saddle period to this other image that I found, which is of 
all of the traces of flights and I think it was over one year. So how do we go from this to this um, kind of increased mobility over time? Um, how does the experience of travel transform culture over time? This is the question at the heart of my book, which brings together two main areas of schol uh, scholarship, the cultural analysis of literature and film and the emerging field of mobility studies. The object of analysis are travel texts, that is literature and film critically engaged in the experience of travel as movement. The selected texts, which are predominantly in German, are reviewed with, within the context of the mobility's turn. I review selected examples of travel writing from a historical period of significant social change defined by Reinhard Koselleck as the saddle period, 1770 to 1830. During this period, I found that a culture founded on mobilities emerged and the desire for travel opened up a space in which new supplementary ideas were formed in relation to technology, Bildung, or that's the German um, concept of educational formation, and culture, um, and I'll give some closer examples of that period shortly. Um, the next part of the book is um, the settled period is then compared to the contemporary period of 1985 to 2010, which comprises two sections. In the first part, encompassing 1985 to 1995, the central focus is on global turning point of 89 to 90. The analysis of travel text shows that travel is increasingly regarded as a human right. In that section, I look at the travel ideals of East German writers and the build-ups to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And um, some examples here are um, Erich Wille's novel Zwiebelmuster from 1985. Um, Zwiebelmuster is another name for the um, blue onion china pattern. And Friedrich Christian Delius' novella, Der Spaziergang von Rostock nach Syracuse, or The Walk from Rostock to Syracuse of 1995. I argue that after 1989-90, the world reaches a point of no return with regard to the global intensification of mobilities. This is intimated in Andre Ujica's documentary film, Out of the Present of 1995, via an extraterrestrial filmic gaze and the obsolescence of the cosmonaut's national identity. In the second part, encompassing 95 to 2010, I evaluate how travellers experience and negotiate the overwhelming presence of intense mobilities. Here, Angelopoulos' film Ulysses' Gaze, 95, and Christoph Hansmeier's dra um, drama Autosoys for Pressure of 2010, or um, Odysseus the Criminal, are examined as contemporary iterations of the Odyssey. These travel texts problematize the possibility of homecoming as opposed to the Greek um, epic Homer's Odyssey of circa 750s to 700 BC, a culturally foundational journey in which the notion of the hero's return to Ithaca is one of an ideal homecoming. In the concluding section of the book, I recapitulate the dominant themes with reference to Bernhard Schlink's um, novel Heimkehr or Homecoming of 2006. You may also know this um, author is the author of um, The Reader. Um, and so in this book, it's like an odyssey of a young man in search of his father. I suggest future directions for research and reflect on the extent to which a German-focused comparative cultural analysis of travel texts makes a useful contribution to the emerging field of mobility studies. Okay. Now I'll just cover briefly in broad terms some of the key findings from the PhD thesis or the book. Um, so, Mapping out a German-focused analytical journey is but one way of tracing the cultural impact of travel through time in geographical space. So I think I found it to be a really useful way. There's multiple ways that you could really map out this kind of a process and do this kind of analysis. Um, but in the book, I also acknowledge some of the limitations of taking that approach as well. So I think every piece of research um, has its advantages and its limitations. So I guess that's what I'm acknowledging there. Um, this study may be viewed as making a contribution to the emerging field of mobility studies in a number of respects. 
To my knowledge, it is one of the first attempts to historicize mobilities and to provide a comparative perspective, primarily on the experience of travel versus the saddle period and the contemporary period of 85 to 2010. It's opened up a space for analytical connections which may not otherwise have been identified or theoretically contextualized. Perhaps one of the most important and somewhat unexpected outcomes of this investigation is a recognition of the vital importance of travel writers and filmmakers in opening up textual spaces which bring to readers and spectators different perspectives on what is happening in the world and thus enable reflection and potential change. Um, contemporary German writer Ingo Schulze suggests that the contemporary writer, or by extension filmmaker, through a keen cultural awareness, intense contact with the everyday citizens, and a propensity toward a high volume of reading, is well positioned to help reinvigorate critical thought and voice the concerns of normal citizens as against um, so-called experts, he says, who so often narrow their focus that the most relevant aspects are left out. So I think he's talking there about the human experience of, of what is happening. Um, the writers and filmmakers analysed in my book bring the value of subjective experience to the fore and have thus, from various perspectives, provided invaluable answers to this question. In addition, they stimulate critical discussion and raise important um, questions concerning our cultural values. These writers and filmmakers highlight a human response to the impact of increasing mobilities whether positive or negative. Overall, the conceptually open and heuristic approach I followed allowed ideas to form and connections to be made in unexpected and illuminating ways. Rather than clearly delineating fiction from non-fiction, for example, I identified ways in which both forms blend into each other and examined instances in which autobiographical elements are adapted in travel text narratives. One key outcome of this method is that it allowed me to recognise the importance of travel, first and foremost, at the conceptual level, as an ideal, um, an image, an idea, or a desire. Mobility's perspective brings a nuanced approach to understanding the changing experience of journeys over time by bringing to light the importance of travel as a conceptual idea and the mobilisation of the concept of home as um, the example from Angelopoulos demonstrated a little bit earlier. Okay, so moving now from the general kind of overview to give you a flavour of what you'll find in the book to um, but giving some more um, specific examples from that earlier period. Um, first, I just want to spend a little bit of time um, to identify why the historian Reinhard Koselleck chose this particular period as being significant. Um, as I said before, that was the particular path that I mapped out in undertaking my research. And I'm sure that there would be a lot of different time periods or geographical journeys that you could take in looking at the work of writers or filmmakers and map out a totally different journey as well. But this is um, the one that I chose. So, prominent German historian, Reinhard Koselleck identified the saddle period, or the Sattelzeit, as a fundamental time of social change, a period of major transition. He does so by detailing the mobilization of people, new ideas and ideologies during the Sattelzeit, which took over from the preceding or pre sattelzeit time of relative stability, or you might call this um, mobility singular. Specifically, Koselleck takes an etymological approach to observe the way in which the meaning of words changed as a result of the wider social, cultural and political transitions occurring during this significant era in the transition to modernity. Koselleck emphasises that the semantic overhaul in the meanings of words and categories taking place during the saddle period was characterised by large change a large-scale change or vicissitude and variation. This is made apparent when he refers to changes in meaning, a new focus on the present moment rather than origins, and changing general circumstances. 
Within the saddle period, old concepts are molded and adapted to meet the changing conditions of the modern world. One might refer to the writers whose journeys during this time I looked at as trying to capture this early period of mobilities as pioneers. And just as a little preface to this seminar series next week, um, I was reading um, Sven Kesselring's um, article called Pioneering Mobilities, New Patterns of Movement and Motility in a Mobile World in the Weekend and thinking how it might connect. Um, you could say possibly that um, these settled period travellers all had different modes of mobile management. I um, was thinking about the different workers more in the contemporary period that um, Kesselving was referring to. Um, or at the least, you could say that their responses to mobility were expressed in a variety of ways. But I'll give you examples of three and we can see whether that's a long bow to draw or not. The writers attempt to discursively capture and reflect on the changing world around them as best they could. While many of them expressed a desire to see what travel could make possible in their lives during this time, individual experiences in dealing with unforeseen circumstances of this period and the way in which this was expressed varied greatly. Okay. So, moving on to the settled period travellers or pioneers. Um, I now briefly canvas responses from three writers to their mobile experiences during the saddle period, and I'll give some brief examples which relate to the following ideas. Technology and travel, time, imagination and writing, changing ideas about field research and culture, and what mobility means for the closeness of human ties. So beginning with um, Georg Forster, who wrote an account called A Voyage Around the World, which was published in 1777. Um, on the 13th of July, 1772, at the age of 18, Georg Forster joined his father, um, Reinhold Forster, as a crewman on Captain Cook's second voyage on the resolution to the regions of the Pacific and Antarctic, including time in New Zealand. Father and son were a last minute addition to the crew after the resignation of the British botanist, Joseph Banks which is quite an interesting story in itself. <laughs> um, but maybe I can tell that later if there's interest. Um, Forster described their general role as to collect, describe, and draw the objects of natural history which we might expect to meet with during our course. The observations of Georg Forster and his questioning of traditional ideas of culture may be viewed as indicative of an emerging generation. This generation, by way of travel, was open to change and sought to experience the world, even if this was at the expense of potentially upsetting those who held to worldviews based largely on static perspectives. Forster took particular issue with, quote, philosophers who have only contemplated mankind in their closets. In other words, he took issue with thinkers who never got out in the field or travel to study their subject matter. Even though Georg and Reinhold Forster's views on the idea of culture were quite different, um, you know, Johann Reinhold Forster certainly agreed with his son that travel was now a requirement for the validity of research. In his own account of the journey, the older Forster wrote, it appears indeed to be the general fault of these writers to study mankind only in their cabinets. Divergence between the writings of father and son can be seen in the way in which they reflect on the cultural differences between indigenous people they encountered on their journey and the European sailors or the ideas of civilized Europeans in, um, more broadly. Whereas in observations made during a voyage around the world of 1778, um, which was Johann Reinhold Forster's text, he denigrates people's, um, he says, unconnected with the highly civilized nations. Georg Forster, in his text, A Voyage Around the World, suggests that without European contact, the, quote, brave, generous, and hospitable Māori would potentially not have suffered such exploitation. The older Forster writes, the human species, when unconnected with the highly civilized nations, is always found more debased in its physical, mental, moral, and social capacity their hearts grow insensible to the dictates of virtue, honour and conscience. 
and they become incapable of any attachment, affection, or endearment. By quite a strong contrast, the younger Forster writes, a race of men who amidst all their savage roughness, their fiery temper and cruel customs, are brave, generous, hospitable, and incapable of deceiving, are justly to be pitied, that love, the source of their sweetest and happiest feelings, is converted into the origin of the most dreadful scourge of life. Referring to the sexually transmitted diseases that were spread to the indigenous women by sailors, Forster laments, the common sailors, ignorant, hardened, licentious, are the true savages. And he finishes um, this book, or there's a line in the book that says, if ever it were possible for Europeans to have humanity enough to acknowledge the indigenous tribes of the South Seas as their brethren, we might have settlements which would not be defiled with the blood of innocent nations. So I think it's really interesting to reflect on the difference between the father and son and where they are similar and where they differ. And the fact that Georg Force almost seems to be implying that um, the indigenous people would not have been exposed to some of this really negative activity if their so-called civilized Europeans had never traveled to the other end of the world and encountered them. Which for that time um, is quite dynamic thinking, I think. Okay, moving on to um, Friedrich Nikolai's um, account of a journey through Germany and Switzerland in 1871, or Beschreibung einer Reise durch, durch Deutschland und die Schweiz im Jahr 1781. So, unlike the hasty addition of the Forsters to Captain Cook's crew in 1772, Nikolai's journey through Germany and Switzerland in 1781 was the realization of a long hoped for and oft pondered trip away from his home of Berlin. His focus is rather external and practical. As Martin surmises, he doesn't narrate, rather he presents documents and judges. In his travel account, he appears to be handing out advice to an audience, he anticipates, of would-be travelers who dwell but need to be educated on aspects of traveling life. He places great importance on the traveller taking time to think about the purpose of his journey before he begins. Nikolai develops and adapts technology in order to maintain some sense of control in the period of emerging new mobilities of the saddle period. He tries to measure, understand and make practical use of what's going on. Perhaps by taking measurements and adapting technology to better serve a mobile lifestyle, he felt better equipped to control or manage life in an era of increasing uns uncertainty and unpredictability. I'll just diverge quickly to the PowerPoint. Um, these are sketches that he's made of an odometer and of how that works with the post coach on which he travels. And I just love these elaborate pictures and you can just almost picture him sitting there, like thinking about it all and putting it into use. So, in, um, during his journey, he tried to capture the immediacy of his experience in his travel writing. Dealing with this time writing challenge was ongoing. Even after the publication of his account, he was adding new information and making changes to subsequent editions to make up for the inaccuracies and inevitable dating of working within a fixed mode of representation. Basically, he was worried that with time passing, fictional elements would creep into his memory and render his accounts inaccurate or not factual. At the beginning of his journey, he attempted to record the day's events each evening, but quickly fell behind. So he resolved to find a way to write while on the move in the coach. Writing with pencil and going over this with ink was still too time consuming, so he then trialled using a portable quill pen to write with ink. In his mind, in order to save time and produce factual and accurate accounts of travel experience, writing while traveling took precedence over all else. Multiple writing methods were tested, corporeal positioning was adjusted accordingly, and technology was developed for mobile requirements. Eventually, he perfected the art of writing on the coach by constructing a form of portable, multi-directional shelf to write on which he could move in order to write within the moving coach. So he develops this technology so that he can write 
while he's moving so that no kind of fictional elements creep into his account and he can then provide the most accurate sort of detail for would-be travellers of the future, I think is kind of the thinking. Ultimately, it seems, he felt that he perfected mobile time management observational skills, and the development of a piece of technology to accurately represent his everyday travel experiences. He says, for certain, we captured three times more observations than some other travellers would have in the same time frame. <laughs> so I think that's quite, quite an interesting one <laughs> on the time writing challenge and how that relates to fact and fiction and that sort of thing. Okay. So then we'll now move on to um, Arlbert von Camiso, and he wrote a book called um, Peter Schlemiel's Wundersame Geschichte, or um, Peter Schlemiel's Miraculous Story. It's got various translations. And you may have heard of in, um, stories before this concept of seven league boots, or seven Meilenstiefen. Um, and the picture, sorry, I'm pointing it out. <laughs> the picture you can see on the third picture on your screen is um, a picture of these boots which um, you might conceive of as kind of like a technological innovation for enhanced mobility but I'll explain that um, just now. So Camiso was born from a French aristocratic family who was um, granted asylum in Berlin from the French Revolution when he was nine. In 1812 when Camiso was studying natural sciences at the University of Berlin the outbreak of the Wars of Liberation meant he had to take refuge again. A Frenchman by birth, he was not able to take up arms on the German side. A coalition of Austria, Prussia, Russia, the UK, Portugal, Sweden, Spain, and a number of German states was fighting Napoleon. It was during this period of asylum in 1813 that Camiso wrote Peter Schlemiel, a work which made him world famous, while ironically, he was an asylum concealed from the world. This is one of the points where we can see the significance of travel as a conceptual idea. While the work is fictional, we see how it relates to Camiso's experience and how it can be regarded as a travel text response to the emerging mobilities of the saddle period. In this way, there is a connection to the work of East German writers before the fall of the wall, who expressed a desire to travel in their work, but for obvious reasons, they couldn't. Um, and that's another area that I look at in the book in the um, more contemporary section. But anyway, back to Camiso. Um, his exile had devastating effects on the young scholar. Dismayed and in hiding in what he now considered his home of Germany, he wrote, I didn't have a native country anymore, or I didn't, have, didn't yet have an, a native country. Despite his obvious increasing affection and loyalty toward Germany, it seemed that at this time his fate and identity were to be determined by his place of birth. It was this feeling of being torn, neither being able to lead a dwelling life, nor to be able to travel as he wished, which first stimulated Camiso to think along the lines of developing the protagonist of a man who becomes separated from his shadow. After selling his shadow in exchange for a magical sack, from which he can produce anything he wants. The main character of this story, Peter, becomes ostracized from society and is unable to lead a peaceful dwelling life as he wishes to. So at the start of the story, he arrives in this place and a man in a gray suit comes up to him and says, if you sell me your shadow, I'll give you this magical sack and then you can produce anything from it that you want. And his response was he thought that was a good idea because then he can impress people and get in with society. But as you sort of go through the story, you realise that people are um, totally put off by the fact that this man doesn't have a shadow. Um, just to explain, if you're not familiar with the story. Um, so some way into the story, um, Peter, having endured the turmoil of the settle period, submits completely to a life devoid of humanity. It is exactly at this point that he receives a pair of sieben Meilenstiefel or seven league boots, which provide him with an enhanced mobility, a compensation for the restrictive shadowlessness he has had to endure. Although fictional, 
one might think of these boots as representing a supplementary technological innovation arising out of the new mobilities in a similar sense to Nikolai's portable writing shelf, which allowed him to write while on the move. When wearing his boots, Peter is able to travel vast distances. So he, he basically sort of bounces around the world carrying out scientific research. Um, in place of human relationships, he has an almost boundless ability to become educated and study nature in almost all parts of the globe. In Peter Shamil, the ultimate message Camiso leaves the reader with is as follows. If you want to live among humankind, learn above all to revere the shadows. Thus, broadly speaking, living in the saddle period leaves one with a choice. Dwell in a socially acceptable way or travel, gaining knowledge but giving up the closeness of human ties. The scholar Ralph Flores sums up the end of the novella and provides a warning against the second of these choices when he says, Peter seems to have gained a self, but can there really be a self at all without a human world? The chilling end of Peter Shamil is to be most alive when dead to the human world. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, I just, yeah, so those kind of ideas were meant to give examples of kind of like this earlier period of mobilities and how the writers were trying to reflect on and experience all of these changes and how if these changes hadn't have occurred, then they wouldn't have come up with these new ways of thinking. Um, so, yeah, there, there are a lot more details in the book, but I was just trying to pitch, pick out a few just to give you a bit of a flavour of what I was trying to look at when I was um, reviewing those texts. Um, we can certainly pop back into more detail during our conversation, um, but just to abruptly jump from 1770 to 1830 to the present day, um, I just wanted to pick out a couple of things that I thought were um, quite interesting. If you're interested in some of these ideas and concepts that I've been talking about. So obviously our current East Loxai summer series, which is great. Um, in February, there's a um, conference at Victoria on, um, it's called the Anza Mems, um, and it's, it's a, got a main concentration on the medieval and early modern studies, but the theme is mobility and exchange, which I think is really interesting, talking about the historicization of mobility and mobilities. Um, you may have seen, um, obviously there's so much going on at Lancaster, but one of the things that stood out for me is this um, Mobilities Literature and Culture inaugural conference in April. So I think that's a really exciting development. And since I touched into this world and did the thesis, I just see more and more of this kind of intersection of mobilities and literature and culture studies all coming together, which is just fantastic. Um, another couple of things um, at the moment, um, in transfers, there's a special section on travel writing and knowledge transfer, um, mobility and art, ideas in motion. Um, and there's an email going around at the moment um, from the um, Mobile Lives Centre in Paris um, about um, promoting mobility's research in the global south, which I know is something that some of us looked at from the um, anthropology journal sites a little bit earlier. So. It's really interesting to see that coming out again too. So, yeah, I guess I'll open it up for questions if um, that's right. <laughs> I can just see you clapping. So I'm just yeah, sorry, I had my microphone on mute. That was great. That was so oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the email about um, the Geo Media Conference as well? It's being held in at Karlstad University in Sweden in May. Okay. Uh, it's uh, Geo Media Spaces of the In Between. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's analyzing and problematizing the relations between any and all communication media and various forms of spatial creativity, performance, and production. Across oh, wow. material, cultural, and social and political dimensions. I'll mm -hmm. forward it to to, um, to Martha, and Martha, maybe you can um, send it on if that's all right. David David sent it to me today, and just as you were talking about the conferences and things on your last slide, I thought, oh, I saw another one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Maybe you'll have to take a leave of absence uh, and eat here uh, and just uh, tour around a bit. <laughs> I know, wouldn't that be fantastic? There's just so many um, conferences coming out on these emailing lists that are just so interesting and just I know. It's such an enabling interdisciplinary kind of a field that new things are coming out all the time that you would just never have conceived of. So yeah. it's a really exciting place. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's also nice for you because you have ready-made material to speak on anywhere <laughs> you go. So, I mean, yeah. you know, it's a fantastic opportunity if you could do some traveling. Yeah, I, I do hope to maybe get to that one in the UK. Um, but yeah. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. I saw that the deadline for um, abstracts has been extended to the 15th as well. So, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got um, a couple I need to do by the 15th. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I um, I submitted something to talk a little bit more about the travel desires of East Germans. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll see how it goes because I'm sure it's a very popular thing to submit to. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the one in April, Lancaster? Yes. Oh, I can't imagine them turning you down. So, <laughs> <laughs> David Bissell, I don't know if he'll be there then, but David Bissell is a, is a visiting fellow over there this year. So next okay. year, so he yeah. might be there when you're there. So. Oh, oh great. Mm. Yeah, it was lovely. He got in touch after I released the book too, so it was really nice. Oh, fantastic. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. 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 So lovely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, can I start with a question or do you have one, Tara? No, no, go for it. Okay. I'm really interested, Anita. I'm in, it, I was interested in so much of what you said. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought I might ask you just to start off with, um, I forgot, I think you mentioned Georg Forster before and I'd forgotten a lot about it. So I was so thrilled you went through some of his life again. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that juxtaposition of the father and the son. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, um, some of the anthropological work that started to come out in the 90s was, well, this, you'd know this more than I probably, have you studied, studied culture, but um, seemed to be questioning the role of, in that case, the anthropologist who, who um, travels from their place of scholarly work to visit a culture and to try and learn as much as they can about it and then go back to their place of scholarly work. And, and it became um, a motif that they viewed themselves as travelers and as, you know, somewhat a little more cosmopolitan because they were going to visit a new culture. Mm. And that they were uh, became critiqued for not seeing the culture they were visiting yeah. as yeah. being composed comprised of travelers, yeah. and um, and I you know think that that people have started to address that in anthropological writing. But I wondered if you saw anything in Forster's writing. Um, you did explain, like I wrote a question down. I wonder how he saw the Maori, and then of course you went right into it. So he obviously was interested in people and interested in connecting and observing and, and um, father and son both wrote about the Maori, but did they consider how much of a traveling culture that was? Or do you remember them? I, I don't think they really knew how much they traveled. Um, I would say they probably had no idea of, of the navigational abilities of the Maori, for example. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Um, like part of what I was looking at in my book was um, kind of the Heideggerian idealized kind of sedentary dwelling kind of um, ideal world, which is based on sort of the Greek story um, of home as a kind of fixed place, so a place of warmth and all that sort of thing. Um, and so I think that when, um, I think that the Georg Forster's view of Māori was probably um, of quite a sort of, simple, uncivilised in, in that kind of times European kind of versus um, Indigenous people kind of a cultural view. Um, but I think if you look at his words, he's kind of talking about um, this ideal kind of love and relationship that they have and then all of the um, devastating impacts that he felt that the European sailors had on them by coming in and passing on these diseases and, and having these kind of and all that sort of a thing which sort of tarnished the ideal sort of perspective that he had on those people um, but he also makes that kind of interesting note about um, you know if ever the Europeans were to acknowledge the indigenous people as their brethren so sort of this as their equal or something then then this kind of 
um, a symmetrical relationship might have some other kind of a form. So I think that he was quite open to kind of learning more and for for his time was quite kind of, um, you know, forward thinking um, at that particular time. Um, but yeah, I, it's sort of, mm. I think it's interesting as well that um, I sort of almost look a little bit as well at this idea of um, mobility as social mobility in the sense of, um, like Goethe's, a lot of his protagonists as well, they kind of, ideally, they go out into the world, they travel, they become learned and educated, and they, then they return to their home, their kind of fixed home place as being an enlightened kind of traveller from their travel experience. And so you might apply the same kind of thinking to what Forster and his father are saying in terms of, like, you know, we're travelling and we're getting out there and we're actually exploring the flora and fauna and native peoples, and so we are better than the people who stay back where they are kind of mm -hmm. um and then you might relate that again to this idea of like well um you know fictional elements of things appearing and, and rendering things inaccurate and a much less fluid perspective about what's true and what's false mm -hmm. um potentially and i think you could bring that right up to date when you think of things like um, backpackers and how they go out to explore the world to gain social and cultural capital through their travels to come back and and to be learned and knowledgeable in a different way to their to their peers who supposedly have stayed at home yeah um, and yet their learning and their knowledge is actually about illicit behavior and you know drinking yeah. and sex and the things that, that actually they can do at home you know, this, this, yeah. this idea of risk-taking, and yet in actual fact, often there is very little risk. Um, yeah. Come back going, I've experienced this. And so it's this, I think it's, it's, it is different, but it's this idea that, that you, you, you move away from a static home to come back and be a, a better person, whatever that might mm -hmm. be. And yet, you know, static, a static home has never really existed. And whilst it's very different now to the, the period you're talking about, even then, mm -hmm. For, for people like the Forsters, you know, home wasn't necessarily static because of how long they were away from home. Yeah, and, and before they came out on um, Cook's journey, they were travelling around as cartographers and translators and things as well, so they had quite a, a mobile background and, and sort of open thinking in that sense. But as you're talking as well about the contemporary period, I'm thinking about these kind of the words that people use to describe their experience where they try and delineate an authentic to an inauthentic experience by calling themselves a traveller rather than a tourist mm -hmm. or, um, you know, the way in which they take photographs of themselves or even, mm -hmm. like, it, sometimes it bugs me the way that people say that they've done a country. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yes, I've done France and Spain and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. does that mean anything? Like... I guess if, if if your value is to cross off mm. places on a map, then then yeah, that can have meaning to you. But <laughs> yeah, 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 it's yeah. just a different way of seeing things. And again, um, that's where I acknowledge as well the limitations of the particular kind of research journey that I traced out as well, because it wasn't sort of till the end of it that I realised that a lot of the writing and films that I did were were written or directed or produced by men as well. Mm -hmm. So then I looked at the the mention of women throughout and often it is the women who are um, back at home, like keeping the home fires burning and that sort mm -hmm. of thing as well, um, with a few exceptions in the book of um, a British cosmonaut, um, Helen Sharman, for example, or, or of those kind of travellers. But I think, um, and also... Just, you know, the, the idea of a Western privileged way of traveling and all that sort of thing. Um, obviously, what these conclusions and observations that I'm in reflections that I'm drawing aren't meant to be indicative of the experience of the entire world or all people mm. and travelers, but um, you've got to map out a path in some way. And I think it would still produce some really interesting findings mm. in doing it that way. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So the, um, the the observations of the son mm -hmm. were contrasted to the observations of the father. Yeah. And did you um, have a sort of a, any other way of contrasting them other than generational or age? I mean, you did say that um, um, 
I remember you did say something else. like I'm just wondering if you could link it if I could ask you just to spell out a bit more uh, in a bit more detail the the break that that period you know that seven, 1770 brought with it like um, you didn't use the word break but you did say sort of um, the modern the beginning of the modern age and that this was a t- time of great social change and I'm just wondering how else we can understand that through I mean it's a very small example I know I, I'll have to go to the book but you know can you explain what else may have influence both these people to have different ideas other than generation um just in terms of like what was going on in the world more generally at that time or what would make foster jr uh, feel um shed some of those imperialistic ideas about um you know observing the natives and then leaving quickly and and he actually seemed to have a far more uh, relational view of, of the people he met as simply people who he, he could um, be with and, and um, you know be ad- admire etc compared to his father but yeah what you know what makes a younger person take on different ideas were those yeah it's you know um, I'm not sure really why um, why the quite stark difference in some respects between the father and his son um, maybe the father was trying to be more protective of his son or have more fixed views about the world that um, resulted in that kind of a um, background. Maybe the son, um, because they were travellers and translators and mappers when they were quite young, perhaps um, the father belonged to a generation where he experienced at a younger age a bit more of a fixed world, whereas that was all that that the um, girl Foster knew. That could be an explanation, I guess. Yeah. Would they have been influenced by the French Revolution or the American establishment of the states in their lifetime, or were they travelling too far away to under to see those changes? Or um, there's a little bit of um, other sort of cultural text and um, thinking that was moving away from the um, kind of like questioning some of these binaries between um, sort of indigenous people and um, highly civilized European people at the time. Um, And I refer to some of those writings in the book that I think might have um, influenced what was going on at the time as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I guess one of the difficulties of looking as well at so many different texts is that, um, and so many different writers and filmmakers is that I don't have a really extensive knowledge of their entire lives the whole way through. Um, but what I focused on was particular elements or works that they did and the autobiographical parts of their lives that seem to relate to those texts or may have influenced those specific ideas um, to kind of weave together the bigger picture and place it in the historical context. So um I guess the the disadvantage of that is that you don't know one person greatly in depth and in, in all of the details of what led to that particular point. Mm. But even as an 18-year-old, would um, Georg Foster have been exposed to ideas about, <clears throat> you know, the rights of man? Yeah. The yeah. right to liberty and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. That one would think would, you know, if his father, his father might have been, say, 36 at least yeah. I suppose and therefore would have been born in the 18, 1740s mm. 1730s so you know you, I, I'm not sure quite if he was considered an old person at that point in his life but um, yeah. I mean he had lived through the same change the same revolutionary ideas and yeah. protests but um, so I'm just trying to sort of understand how, because, I'm sorry to take so much time, but I'm just, one of the things I was thinking, especially at the beginning of your slides was, how do you see a period? How can we see um, change, a social social change during a period mm-hmm. without looking back on it? You know, I mean, I think at one point you said, um, I can't remember if it was after Goethe's stone. Uh, yeah, the Reinhard Kosselink uh, slide. Mm-hmm. Um, and how he defined the 
Zeit, <laughs> period. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah the, um, large scale change. You see, aren't all societies always going through change? But you don't, like when I grew up in the 70s, I didn't consider it particularly revolutionary, but now people yeah. refer to changes in the 70s and you're sort of thinking, what? That was the most boring decade we had. So, <laughs> yeah. I just wonder if there are any other things that were sort of remarkable in the 1770s that might have influenced Georg's ideas. Yeah, I think um, that, like you say, you can choose, you can argue from a lot of different perspectives that different time periods are significant for their own particular reasons. But um, I, in the book, like I identify quite a lot of things that were happening in the world at the time that you might, and I think a lot of people kind of, think of this period around 1800 as kind of marking quite a different change from one period to another and that the world is just, you know, totally um, pluralizing and people are moving in all directions and there's the grand tour and all this kind of stuff going on. Um, so, yeah, I, I found it quite a useful period to look at, but um, you might easily do a comparative um, also of what was happening in the 70s or that sort of thing as well. I think it, it depends what you're looking at and what you're looking for. Oh, yes. No, no, no. No, that's fine. No, no. I was thinking more. I'm very interested still in the 1770s, and I definitely think some of those other things that you mentioned, yeah. even writings, poets, you know, the, the romantic yeah. stuff was coming. The thing, the particular essay that I was thinking of that might have influenced um, Forster was called um, The Duties of Man. Um, so I might be able to dig that one out and um, send it to you. It's yeah. written by Giuseppe Mazzini. Okay. Duties of Man. M-A-Z-Z-I-N-I. Mm -hmm. um, was it about men's role in society or was it more an abstract yeah. the duties of people? Um, it was kind of about looking forward and kind of getting rid of some of these static ideas about um, binaries and culture and that kind of thing. It was a pretty dynamic essay for its time. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. I, I was wondering whether this, this sort of saddle period, because at one point you were sort of talking about how that sort of 1989-90 period is, mm. a, you know, you said the world reached a point of no return mm. in regards to sort of mobility. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether over a longer period of time that you're sort of the saddle period you're looking at is another one of those points. Um, yeah. You, you know, it's one of those, it's, a, it's that tipping point where you you can look back, but you can't go back. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that was kind of the idea to look at those two periods as significant periods in history of, yeah, when things changed irrevocably, basically, and, and how people reflected on those periods of change. Um, and that's where, I mean, this might be a little bit political, but I think um, when you look at some of the recent events in world history that people are trying to, um, you see that kind of thing happening where, for example, with the Brexit, maybe people were trying to imagine a world how it used to be when people weren't so interdependent on each other and the neoliberal system of everyone depending on each other for trade and political mm -hmm. values and all that kind of stuff in Europe. Um, when times get a little bit tough economically, sometimes people try and revert mm -hmm. to former idealised notions of nationhood and put up the walls and want to branch off and be independent. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that politics and social life and employment patterns and everything, the economy is so dependent on this way that has had to flow with mobilities that you can't necessarily return to things the way that they were. And so I think, for example, where you see um, the new political era in the US with Trump leading in a very sort of inward focused um, rhetoric coming from him, that we might see the world still, the geopolitical world still moves forward in terms of um, diplomatic relations and economic ties. And so you might see, for example, with the TPP, mm. a new kind of arrangement going forward that doesn't include the states. Yeah. So I'll be really interested to observe the way in which this kind of thing um, impacts on countries, whether they'll mm. sit back and see what happens over the next four years or whether there'll be new formations and new connections and new kind of 
mobility of ideas, travel and people forming as a result of some of those kind of political things that have happened, like the Brexit and the Trump leadership and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think we're hitting on another one of those moments. Mm. You know, that, 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 that so much has happened in the last few years that you sort of think that maybe this is another one of those times where in 10, 20, 30, 100 years' time, yeah. we'll look back and, and see, see a, a shift mm. in the same way that, you know, your two comparative periods uh, illustrate that same thing. Yeah. And so when you look at theories of, you know, East versus West or clash mm. of civilizations or all that kind of stuff, like how is that, is that playing out? Are we, are we focusing on globalization as, as East West? Is it, is it homogenization? Is it hybridization? There's all those kind of mm. arguments that are going on as well. And even, you know, I always like just winding back to that Benedict Anderson idea from I think the late seventies where he said that, you know, the nation is just an imagined community and, the horror that that draws for some people as kind of a, you know, post-structural, like constructed idea of who you are and how you identify in the world. So it's it's just interesting to see the way that that can shape and yeah. change so dramatically in the current events. Of yeah. What's happening and and recent history. <laughs> yeah, it it links you know mobility links with very much with some some of the ideas that you see is of well that you talked about, but I think Chris talked about a bit last week. But ideas of freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mo- you know, we are free if we are mobile, and yet that very mobility is constrained by nationalist agendas. Who who is allowed a passport? Who can access that border? Who can cross that border? And so, yeah. whilst it, you know, it, whilst we all have these transnational relationships where boundaries and nations become meaningless, mm-hmm. we are also very much controlled by the very state we are trying to escape from. Yeah, and that's where I, I, like some of the things that I really liked from the work that I looked at in the contemporary period, like mm. Christoph Ransmeyer's book about Odysseus, uh, Odysseus the criminal. Um, mm. He looked, it's almost like an, an anti-hero or an anti-journey um, journey, where, journey where the protagonist has come back to um, Ithaca and he's not accepted by his family because he's been away at war and there's rubbish all over the beach and everyone's at strife with each other. And, and this mm. kind of, I think he's really provoking these ideas of, have we gone too far? Are we not thinking about what we're doing or what it's happening in the world and, and all those kind of things? And that's where I think, you know, these some of these writers and filmmakers make a really interesting contribution to yeah. some of the work and that's being picked up really widely in the mobilities yeah. sphere as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, um, Anita, can you take that a bit further? Does, it, it, does he sort of p- portray homecomings as being... Um, not useful, you know, that we shouldn't even give in to this desire to go home and find that place of comfort? I think that a lot of these writers, kind of like um, Angelopoulos' quote from the start, are looking at um, pushing um, kind of like, number one, let's stop and think about what's happening and what impact that's having on our sense of selves and, and how we do things with each other and extending wider to the environment and all that kind of stuff. And two, that they're saying um, maybe our new sense, we need to think about this and reconceive ideas of culture. And, for example, can we reconceive of home not as a a fixed place um, or as a static idea or as a, um, you know, particular location, but as a feeling, as a concept, um, as a feeling of peace, as um, a value of relationships and all that sort of thing. So I feel like that's kind of like the particular angle that people are pushing. Mm. And I think that becomes more true as, as um, during, during various periods in history, we see that, that home is not a place for, for many people because they have been pushed mm. away from home. Um, think, think Syrian refugees and the refugee crisis in, in Europe last year. Think, think second world war. Think, well, even thinking about your, your last example of the, you know, hiding out in the country he feels of as home uh, and writing a fictional story that, that helps uh, discuss his angst in many ways yeah. and how, how home, home isn't a static place and nor is it always a welcome place. In actual fact, home may be just in our heart because um, the, our actual space where we are at the moment is actually quite hostile. Yeah. 
um, it just made me think while you're talking as well, there's a, um, an article by James Clifford um, called Travelling Cultures and Cultural Studies. Um, I think that was a journal and um, it's actually from 1992, but he talks about this question of um, instead of saying, where are you from, saying, where are you in between? Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I really, yeah. yeah, I really liked that idea because often when you say to people, where are you from, they sort of will, well, that might say, well, from everywhere, you know, like, so I'm, <laughs> I grew up here, but my mum's from here and my dad's from there. And, and then you kind of get into the whole realm of um, TCK, like third culture kids yeah. um, that you're probably familiar with. And, mm -hmm. And I was kind of new back again to um, perhaps um, Christopher's idea of interplacedness and identity as being formed um, between and like relationally and constructed through language and experience and mm. being dynamic and all those kinds of ideas. Mm. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have heard that the Clifford's idea of that before. I really like that. Yeah. But I really like that. You know, you know, I don't, I, I, I have to say personally, you know, from a personal perspective, you know, where are you from is, is a question I actually try to avoid asking mm. you know, how difficult that is for me to answer, let alone, you know, the many international students we have around. Yeah. So I'll have to say, you know, where, where is home for you or, you know, where were you before this? Or, or try and come up with a different question because, yeah. you know, what is home? And, and so many have got multiple homes along a, a dispersal path uh, for, for various reasons, whether they whether it's uh, voluntary or whether it's because they've been pushed. Um, and, and so, you know, what, what is home? home? Home is not static. Home is, I, I really like um, the Angelop An Angelo Opolis thing, the home is an effective concept. Yeah. I think that's a, a really, really nice way of thinking about it. Yeah. And you can kind of bring that back almost as well to, I was talking with um, my flatmate last night who's from Spain and kind of explaining this um, tie, arbitrary tie that New Zealand has to the UK in a way, like we're talking about um, the Prime Minister resigning from New Zealand and why is he called a Prime Minister? Because it's tied back to the UK and, mm. and that almost arbitrary kind of um, tied in place tradition that's just set in stone for a way but that completely doesn't seem to fit with where mm. New Zealand is at the moment um, but in some ways you don't want to get rid of because it's a tradition and a set of circumstances that has led to where things are today to some degree so yeah. Yeah. going back again maybe to the kind of symbols from the stone of good fortune of kind of these country forces and where do you take it and how do you balance it mm. And, and the idea then that time is not linear mm. because the, the historical and the future and the present are actually all a bit muddled because we can see how the historic influences now, but also how the future influences where we want to go and, and that, that we can't see a line that is easy to draw because yeah. it's actually so problematic. Yeah. And I think like reading some of that earlier work, um, I was kind of sometimes struck by two thoughts at once. And one is that, it's hard to understand without placing the lens of today's understandings and perspectives mm -hmm. of the earlier work. Um, so you're trying to look into the writer's life and the social circumstances of the time to see why they would write in a particular way mm -hmm. or understand the world in a particular way, perhaps. But at the same time, often being struck at how kind of timeless the human condition is or can be expressed in the sort of things that people write about that you feel very tied to in your experiences in the present moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's that contradiction, isn't it? That it's both, it's both very much in the past and yet, and yet in many ways things haven't changed. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. Really, really fascinating. How about um, where you'll be buried? Do you think that some, that some people connect? Mm that final resting place with some concept of uh, roots and identity that could be connected to home? That's a really interesting question. Um, I remember being at a conference um, a few years back and someone talking about 
different modes of um, or different cultural expressions of how people are buried, which is a very kind of a morbid but very interesting kind of topic. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there's obviously totally different ideas about where, where you want to be buried, whether people think there is an afterlife and you continue in some form. Or I really liked personally this idea that um, one person had where you were buried beneath the tree and people would have GPS coordinates so that they could go and visit you in a forest. Mm. And I've also heard some really interesting podcasts about um, basically some of the formaldehyde, like this is really more, mm. <laughs> some of the formaldehyde and chemicals that people use um, to preserve um, bodies mm. can be really bad for the environment. So a person making a kind of a cape that makes you um, kind of become part of the earth again. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> um, it was natural burial type. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's very interesting to think about. I guess that maybe that is an area already, or could be a new area, like mobilities mm. beyond life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, you think about how it, how somewhere like New Zealand, or even sort of the, what might would have been called the colonies, and how people are tied to other places. Mm. and or tied back to New Zealand through you know families and where they're buried and how that makes them relate to home so David I know has quite strong ties to places outside of Glasgow because he's gone and he's found where great 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 grandfathers are buried yeah um, and the family you know and where the family lived and 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 so this tie to this this body that is no longer there in the ground because it's it's now part of the earth. It it's holds tremendous sway on who he thinks he is and where home might be. And the and the the, the journey to New Zealand has a huge impact. You know who travelled, how they travelled, the yeah. connections that were made. So yeah, it's really, that's yeah. yeah. Well, I once um I probably have two points in response to that one. I once heard an interesting observation by someone from Europe who was saying they felt a little bit ill at ease in New Zealand because the land on which they would walk, there hasn't been so many people walking Mm. on that earth for Mm. as long a time as might have been in Europe. So Mm. they felt like this is not well-trodden earth, so it's kind of a a funny place to be Mm. in. Mm -hmm. Um, The other comment I would maybe make is, um, which I'm sure you've probably thought about yourself, is that, that sort of the the sensory response of travel maybe that over time you kind of back in the day um you have a lot of these german writers walking through europe and mm-hmm. really kind of physically touching base with the land and walking across it and feeling the earth and that being part of the an important part of their journey whereas now you kind of move into like these gaming worlds and this that, kind of virtual yeah. reality and people sending e-postcards and all this kind of a, kind of stuff where has the value changed that just seeing an image is actually enough to to perceive some sense of travel or mobility mm-hmm. or that kind of thing. Um, or even going, like, one of the things I kind of look at in the overview of the book is kind of this gaze that goes from yeah, that sort of earthbound perspective further out to planes and further out to you know, space. Mm. Um, in some of the cosmonauts that I look at and um, Andre Ujica's film Out of the Present of taking, making these really interesting kind of contradictory comments of saying things like these sailors who were travelling in this, like in the kind of saddle period, were undertaking huge unanticipated journeys, mm. whereas we are travelling, but we're also not travelling at all because they're in they're going huge distances around the globe, but they're also staying in the same place in this kind of tiny, you know, this little space shuttle. So they yeah. felt as though they weren't actually kind of interesting pioneering adventure by comparison to the travellers of the earlier days. So those are some of the things that I pick up as well. Mm, that's bad. That's and I want to ask you, Anita, um, have you thought of writing a paper just on Nikolai? Um, that would be a fascinating paper just to hear about his obsession with, yeah, <laughs> with the amazing. odometer and then uh, the draw, you know, not fast enough. Yeah. Um, and then the portable quill mm. and then the shell, yeah. you know, and I just think the whole thing just by itself would just be fascinating mm. to pull out. Yeah. 
of the book. I don't know if you've already, you know, done it and feel that you don't, couldn't return, <laughs> but it's so interesting. Well, I think it's really interesting if you um, compare him to um, someone <laughs> like Herder, who's um, um, John Noyes has also just written about, who writes about a, uh, the journal of his journey in the year 1769, because um, Herder is kind of like almost the opposite of Nikolai in that he suddenly just gets sick of his life and escapes in the middle of the night and gets on a boat and really enjoys just like travel as a means of escaping all the problems in his life. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the new perspectives that are opened up to him by what he sort of refers to as like, um, like reading, like mobile reading almost. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of saying, if you read about the, the journey of um, Odysseus while you're on the move, then you can better connect with it and understand it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so he's kind of really escaping and he's open to what's happening around him in this really kind of experiential way and reflecting on things and thinking like, like a total over, almost a neurotic kind of over analyzer you would imagine him as. Whereas like you, you have this totally different response from Nicola who's like, right, I'm going to go on this journey and the purpose of it is this. And I'm going to draw these amazing detailed pictures and make sure that the technology is perfect so I can capture it accurately. And yeah, so you're still overall looking at people traveling in the same kind of a period and responding to it in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I found really interesting about looking at, that period. Absolutely. I mean, people um, have enjoyed reading Simmel's work about the city because it's sort of like 100 years ago, somebody noticed those same impressions. And But, you know, here's somebody in the 1770s who was trying to work out how to take a pen with him. I just think it's fantastic. Mm. Yeah, really I, I really enjoyed like reading that for the first time as well. I um, bet. Aside from it being in the really difficult to read old German text. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah. 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 Gosh, well, I'm sure we could keep going on for a long time, but thank you so much for that was just a fantastic talk and really yeah. wonderful. So, yeah, I loved seeing the photos. I loved the way you pulled it together and um you gave us some really nice images too to work with to think about and you know things like the the the, um, the wobbly shelf inside the carriage and the traveling shelf and um, and the father and son and there's just some really interesting uh, thoughts and images there as well as the globe and the cube thank you so much for explaining that and bringing that and the beautiful um, watercolor painting mm. yeah.